I'm on. How do I sound? Great. Okay, thank you guys so much uh, for coming. Um, my name is Alex Jaffe. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Blinkity. I'm a data scientist, a designer, and a programmer at SpryFox. And um, today I'm going to be talking about metagame balance. And it's going, to be, um, it's going to be sort of a deep dive into this one really, really focused aspect of game balance. It's kind of like the 25-minute lightning talk for some 800-minute ring cycle talk that I'll give in my bathtub or something. And um, I'm really just going to be developing one big idea this whole time. So um, sort of hold tight and listen up. Does this work? All right. Oh, it goes that way. OK. So. Um, in the fall of 2012, I worked on this game, PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. It's a four-player icon brawler with all the Sony characters, and it was my job to sort of take all the data that was coming in from players playing the game and help the designers balance it. So figure out where the game could be more interesting or deep or more fair or, you know, just kind of more fun for players. Look at what they're doing. And by the way, the game is actually really great and uh, pretty unique, despite its passing resemblance to the other four-player icon brawler, Shrek Super Slam. <laughs> So, um, you know, yes, we wanted to understand a lot about the game, but one of the things that we cared the most about was, uh, it doesn't work. I have to point it, probably. Okay, I'm using my keyboard. There we go. <laughs> one of the things we cared the most about was character balance. So this is, here I'm not talking about how the game feels to play, how players play the game. It's more just, I have a character that I like. I'm coming to this game, and I want to be able to play this character and win, right? I want to be able to feel like this character is not, over, is not underpowered or that some other character isn't overpowered. Um, it's, a, it's a really important concept. It's almost like players need to be able to play the metagame in a way that feels good. It's not the only thing that matters, but I think anyone who's worked on eSports knows that this kind of concern is pretty paramount. Whether you're worrying about classes in TF2, or uh, you know, loadout profiles in COD, or races in StarCraft, or sort of team dynamics in League of Legends, this is an issue that you have to wrestle with. Now, for most of this talk, I'll be talking about fighting games, because they kind of actually have one of the simplest metagames out there. But I just want you to think throughout this whole thing about how the stuff I'm going to talk about is still relevant to these other genres of games with some modifications. So we care about character strength, but how do we evaluate it? And what are we even talking about when we say a character is overpowered? This is kind of one of the central questions I'm wrestling with. Uh, there are a lot of different ways we talk about character strength, and I'll focus on two right now. One is win rate. That is, how often does Kratos win against in an average game? Okay, and you can, if you have data from the game, you can plot it, you can look at it, you can say, okay, these characters look a little overpowered, these characters look a little underpowered. Or if you're feeling really masochistic, you can listen to players. And players will tell you something completely unlike anything you've actually seen in the data. And it's totally perplexing, right? This is a tier list from IGN from shortly after the game came out. And, um, you know, it says that these two characters, Kratos and Raiden, are just completely overpowered and dominating the game. In contrast, if we look at their win rates, sort of doesn't look like there's much correlation there at all, right? One of them is sort of middle, the other is middle high. So while we work on this game, you know, I think I was really confused by this discrepancy. And it's really tempting to say, well, the players don't know what they're talking about or something, right? Uh, they're not great players, or even if they are, they only care about the guys with the big swords or something like that. And yet, you know, we still do take their views into account even when we say something like that. When we patched the game, we tried to address win rates as well as the characters that players perceived as unbalanced. And so, okay, one of the things that uh, I realized was happening here, one of the properties that these, characters, that these characters had who players really thought were overpowered was play frequency was very, very high. Um, what is with this clicker? Okay, that is, Kratos and Raiden were by far the most played characters in the game. So, okay, this maybe starts to point to what's going on, right? The players are just facing these opponents over and over again. It's like, it's no wonder it's frustrating. And we have to think about player experience. That's what we're doing, right? We're trying to create a good player experience. So this suggests a totally different way to think about game balance. Maybe we could just look at play frequency as our sort of canonical truth of what it means for a character or an asymmetric option in general to be unbalanced. And maybe we just nerf the, you know, most played options. I mean, there are several reasons why that's not a good idea, but I still think there's some fundamental nugget of truth why this is good. First of all, let's say we restrict to expert players. So we just look at the play frequency for the best players in the game. Okay, then, okay, this isn't just going to be people like big swords. These players are playing to win, right? They're picking their characters in a way that is going to let them get to the top of the rankings, right? So, okay, all of the characters who they're playing frequently are going to be winners. So then the question is, okay, is, is that enough? Can we just look at play frequency and that's our, that's our you know, source of truth on, on what, is, what is too much, what needs to be addressed in the game? But there is another problem, 
and that is the instability of play rates. Here's some data from the game uh, shortly after our first patch. So you, what these are are play rates for different characters on the second week after that patch and the fifth week after that patch. Okay, and what you see is they are all over the place, right? If these players are playing to win, right, and these are indeed high skilled players, why are they changing so much? Why is Kratos almost doubling in popularity over the course of a few weeks? Your first guess should be that, okay, the patch came out, players have figured out something new about the game, right? So now they are, they're realizing Kratos is more powerful, they've gotten better technique, and they are winning with him, so more players play him. But here are the win rates in the same time period. This graph is extremely zoomed in, okay? So they're essentially not changing at all. These characters are staying fixed in effectiveness, and yet players are adopting them and leaving them behind for seemingly no good reason. Okay, so if play rates are so unstable, um, first of all, why? Okay, well, I said players are playing to win, but there are multiple viable options, right? As we can see, like, there are actually a lot of good characters in this game at the, at the top level. It's relatively balanced. And unfortunately, players have free will, and so we can't just, you know, know exactly what they're gonna do. There, there are a lot of options. Um, we would love it if we could just predict the future, like, okay, this game comes out. It's been out for a couple days. We sort of get all the data on the left side. Now, we wanna know where the game is heading. Like, is some character just gonna completely dominate the metagame? Um, so it'd be great if we could predict the right side of this graph, right? Know right away, okay, like, Kratos is just gonna start dominating, we wanna patch him or something. Or maybe even predict it solely from playtesting, right? Get some data ourselves, never release the game, and put it out in a state where this doesn't happen. But of course, as I said, the problem is players have free will, they have choice. There are all these different states Drake might go to, right? He might, uh, you know, players might decide to play him less, they might decide to play him a ton. It's pretty hard to just predict the future when, you know, we're dealing with human beings. So I have a, a more meager goal, and that's to predict all the futures. Um, so that is basically to know, what if we could say just something about the range of possible values for how often Drake will be played? Kind of understand this whole span of, of possible, uh, possible metagames that we might up in, end up in, right? And also know, you know, that within a few weeks, say, once players have learned that Kratos is effective, and they've adopted him, that, say, um, all of the metagames that we might end up in involve Kratos being played way too much, so much that it's gonna frustrate players who have to play him, frustrate players who face him, and also frustrate spectators if we're dealing with esports. Well, this, this would be great. This would be a great future, or sorry, a great reality because we can actually, you know, balance our games before players have kind of unbalanced them for us. And I, this is actually what I'm proposing. I call it metagame bounds. It's a new way to think about asymmetric strength. You can sort of do this. <laughs> um, basically produce these bounds on the, the most, the sort of highest frequency you might expect to see a character be played in a reasonable metagame full of expert players and the lowest frequency. Um, you know, it won't be perfect, but I think by the end you'll be convinced that, you know, there's actually a way to do this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the metagame as I view it. Uh, it's a very, very kind of focused, specific view of the metagame talk about how that helps us enable this construction, these, these metagame bounds, and then finally, how we can use those bounds to find imbalances in the game. All right, so, um, after I finished working on PlayStation All-Stars, I, uh, I did, I finished my PhD at the University of Washington, which my dissertation was on game balancing, and near the very, very end of it, I was uh, looking at this matchup charts for Street Fighter IV, um, and it, something struck me about it. So here's how these charts work. Um, you pick a character on the row, like C. Viper. You pick a character column, like, uh, who is that? Akuma. And, um, and then the six there, in the middle, uh, means there's a six in 10 chance of that, of Fei Long beating Akuma in a fair match of a high skill game, okay? Now the thing about these charts is they are totally made up, but they're still pretty good. So literally a bunch of people got in a room who you know, perceived themselves to be expert players and they decided what these numbers should be. So you should think, okay, I shouldn't believe these at all. But I argue they're still really useful. First of all, they're well-defined, unlike tier lists. S tier, A tier, these don't actually mean anything. Everybody has a different definition for what this means. Whereas a 60% win rate is very, very well-defined. It's something we can, we can discuss and we can figure out what the right number is. We can even, you know, look at actual data and figure out some approximation of the truth here. On top of that, it's unaffected by play frequency. So remember, part of the problem we're trying to wrestle with is we can't just look at the current metagame because it's sort of, it's all over the place, it moves with time naturally, it sort of converges into these different equilibrium and moves around and, and what we need to know is the whole possible space of this. So we need some source of data that is unaffected by this play frequency. And indeed this is, you know, if a lot more players start playing C Viper, that doesn't mean her win rate against Akuma is going to substantially change. It might change a little because players will learn more about how to play her, right? But that, 
that change will be much slower. Developing new techniques for a game happens slowly compared to moves, movements in the metagame, which, as I showed you, happen very, very quickly. So even knowing the matchup chart right now is extremely useful. So my goal sort of is to, um, is to take these matchup charts, these, these sort of impenetrable walls of numbers, and, and to find their secrets, like the protagonist in Pi who has this 216-digit uh, string of numbers who's trying to find the secrets of God through it. It's kind of like that. It's like, are there some fundamental secrets of the game that we can find in these matchup charts, right? Do they define, like, how the metagame might work in all possible universes? And, and I, I think they do. Um, some people who have tried to uh, analyze them before, in fact, everyone who makes these matchup charts produces these averages, these, these, sorry, these sums on the right side. It's just the sum of all the numbers. And so they say, okay, Seth has the highest sum of numbers. He's maybe the strongest character in the game. Nobody actually believes these because it's totally overly simplistic. It says, basically, basically it's how often does Seth win against an average opponent. But you never face an average opponent. You face other strong opponents who are themselves defined by their ability to face strong opponents. It's the cyclical thing that's very, very hard for a human to reason about. But it is possible for a computer to reason about, and that's where I'm going. Um, to do that, we need to treat this matchup chart itself as kind of the source of information, the source of definition for some game. Basically, metagame the game. Not that metagame the game, Eric Zimmerman's metagame the game, but, but a different metagame the game. Literally, the game that is playing the metagame of any sort of competitive game. And what if we take it seriously as a game worthy of analysis on itself, right, of its own, and, um, you know, and actually you know, um, analyze it? Well, I call it the selection game, just to be really clear, and use a name, and it's, it's super simple. We're coming to play a game of Street Fighter. We sit down, we're going to pick characters to play. We do it simultaneously and in secret. And then there's some chance that I win based on the character I chose. And I'm not even going to uh, play the game. I'm just selecting my character, just like you. And then robots who play just like us will play for us. And then, you know, if uh, I play Zangief and you play Guile, I win 60% of the time. But it's just randomness. So my goal now is just to pick the right characters. We'll treat ties as 50% win chance for simplicity. OK, what kind of game is this? Well, it's basically rock, paper, scissors, which makes it sound super boring, <laughs> but there's still something interesting here. It's a generalization of rock, paper, scissors, right? It's this, like, um, princess bride poisoning game where we're, like, you know, trying to figure, I'm trying to think about what you're trying to think about what I'm trying to think, this Yomi game. But the good news about these games is that they are well covered by game theory. We know how to analyze them extremely well. And the most important concept you need to know here is the notion of an optimal strategy which just means it's a way that I can play such that I win at least half of my games. No matter what you do, no matter what you know about my strategy, I'm always going to guarantee that I win half the games. OK. Um, the problem is that any fixed strategy can be exploited, right? If I just play rock and you know that, then you will win every time because you'll win paper. You'll play paper, excuse me. But if I play randomly, if there's some unpredictability, then I can do better. Right? So I, we have this notion of a mixed strategy, which is a probability distribution over these pure strategies. Um, and so if I play one-third rock, one-third paper, and one-third scissors, then there's nothing you can do to exploit the knowledge of that strategy. Right? Even if you decide, okay, I'm just gonna, you decide to play rock, you win half the time. If you win, play paper, you win half the time. No matter what, if you play some randomized strategy, you still win at most half the time. So uniformly random, it wins half the time, and that's optimal. Since the game is symmetric, I can't ever do better than guaranteeing winning half the time, right? OK, so that's all the game theory I'm going to teach you. It's like one slide or something. I recommend Frank Lance's game theory talk. It's an hour, and there's a lot more interesting stuff in it. But this is all we need for now. OK, so now I can actually talk about how we construct these metagame bounds. So um, you might see where I'm going. We have a, um, you know, say, a, a selection game like this. This is some StarCraft II data from some tournaments a few years ago. And now we want to know what rate should I play each of these characters? Right? How often should I play Terran to ensure that I don't get dominated by, say, my bad matchup against, or how often should I play Protoss to make sure I don't get dominated by my bad matchup against Protoss? Bad example. Anyway, um, the way we solve this is with a linear program. It's just like this. It's really simple. You just plug it into an LP solver, let it run, and voila, you get your probabilities. Uh, you don't actually need to know how that works. Um, but it is, um, it is actually quite simple if you have the right libraries. Literally, it's just a few lines of code. Um, and you, know, you can efficiently so find the solution to any of these games, these zero-sum games. You can find the probability distribution that you must play to you know, win as best you can. So here, let's say it's 36% Terran, 34% Protoss. Could these be, like, should we think of these as the expected frequencies that we would see Terran and Protoss and Zerg appearing in the wild, since that's our goal? Well, no, because there, there are actually two problems with that. 
The first is that I've been treating this game of selecting, say, characters in a fighting game as this one-time thing. I sit down, we play together, every round I'm gonna pick a character independently from the last. But that is not how communities work, and specifically that's not how esports work. These games have huge execution barriers, require a ton of skill, and you know, for a game like Street Fighter, say, um, you know, a character may, sorry, a player may spend years training with one character. They're not just gonna pick the character that's gonna, you know, do the best in this particular matchup. They're gonna be kind of stuck on their character. So it seems like these single round games, these zero sum games, these selection games can't really say much about what a real community will look like, right? Because it has to do with this very human property. It's kind of like spanning outside the magic circle of what people train over time. But I have an argument that there actually is a much deeper connection between these two models than you might think. So um, consider the following model for how a community forms, okay? Imagine you have, say, a third Ryu's, a third Zangief's, and a third Kami's in some community of Street Fighter players. And they're basically stuck on their characters. Everybody plays their character almost all the time because it's so important to train with that one. But then a new player comes along, and he's gonna play for a while and pick the character that lets him totally dominate the current characters. So he picks Fei Long, right? Because Fei Long, uh, you know, has an advantage against each of these. And the new player comes along and she picks Fei Long too, right? Because Fei Long has this advantage, it's great, right? You can basically exploit the weakness in the current community. And this keeps happening for a while until finally there are a lot of Fei Longs. And then someone has this amazing idea, they realize like, I'm gonna play Balrog, because Balrog has an advantage against Fei Long, and now I can get more wins, right? So imagine this is a process, this is a process that describes how your community forms. It seems not so crazy far from reality. But the amazing fact is that this process is identical to an algorithm called fictitious play. And this algorithm is a way to compute the optimal strategy to a selection game. Which means that, over time, the percentage of players who we see sort of playing Ryu in a community is going to converge to the percentage chance that you should play Ryu in a single round of this game. Okay? This is really important. This means that we have this selection game, right? We have this, you know, this little game where we just, you and I just play once, but however it is that I should play that game is actually how we should see an entire community of players kind of like adopting characters over the course of years. Again, I've oversimplified the model, but I think it points to some fundamental truth. So now it seems like, okay, we're in a position where we can take these matchup charts or selection games and we can compute an optimal strategy for them and hopefully get some information about which characters are gonna get played in the wild. And we did this here for that Street Fighter IV chart and you get something like this, which is totally, utterly wrong. Uh, if you've ever played Street Fighter IV, you know that first of all, more than nine of the 39 uh, characters get played. This was before the recent patch, there were 39. Uh, moreover, a third of the players don't play Balrog. <laughs> that is not uh, reality. Uh, Balrog's a fine character, but it is not a third of the players. So there's still one problem with our method here. And the problem is that perfectly optimal play is not realistic, right? Players may play to win. Players may be very good at playing to win. Uh, and, you know, despite this, they're not going to play perfectly. They might play some approximation of perfectly, right? And, um, Beyond that, there's some noise in the data. We have these matchup charts. They're not perfect. Even if we've taken them from real data from the wild, they're still gonna be noisy. So we can't have this very stringent dependency on you know, absolutely perfect optimal play if we wanna learn something about our game. But we can think about approximately optimal play. So the idea is, okay, we wanna know how often um, you, know, you can win while playing Balrog some percentage of the time. We wanna know, can, can you play is it possible to be, have a very effective community that has 12% Balrog in it? So we force our strategy to play Balrog 12% of the time, and then we check, can you still win a lot, essentially? So we modify our linear program. You don't need to know the details here, but you put one more constraint on it, and then you pop out here uh, this, this um, set of play rates. It's totally different than the last one, right? And this says, okay, this is the one where we know Balrog is played exactly 12% of the time and then we can check the one where he's played 13% of the time and 14% of the time and sp sort of explore this whole space of what play rates look like when one of the characters appears at some frequency. All right, and this actually gets us what we want because now we can make a chart like this. And let me make sure you really understand what this chart is saying. At the bottom we have play rates, that is, you know, played 5% of the time or 20% of your community or whatever, and then the two sides of this interval tell you the minimum frequency you should expect this character to occur and the maximum frequency, frequency you should expect them to occur. So um, this says Balrog, in any stable, strong Street Fighter community that wins you know, most of the time against any kind of outsider who tries to exploit them, you'll see at least 3% you know, Balrog or something. But you'll see at most 35%. You know, so it's actually a huge range. Players have a lot of freedom in this game to pick the characters they want to pick. And everyone can appear at least, you know, 
at some frequency within a sort of strong competitive metagame. So that's great. I mean, Street Fighter 4 is a very balanced game. But the real purpose of these bounds is to help us find problems in our, in our meta, right? Possible problems. So I'm going to talk about three kinds of characters that these graphs let you find. I'll call them always excluded, sometimes dominant, and always dominant characters. All right. So um, I just want to be absolutely sure we understand what this graph means. It means if you look at the character at the top left, uh, at the left top, then the left point means you have to play Balrog at least 5% of the time in a stable community. The right point means you have to play him at most 40% of the time. All right. So finding imbalances. Here's a matchup chart that I derived from some data, again, player, player made up <laughs> on Smash Wiki for Super Smash Brothers Melee. You don't need to look at the numbers. Um, what you do need to see is the matchup charts that it produces. So um, I want to focus your attention first on these entries. Okay, these are the ones where the right side of the green bar is all the way to the left. And what that means is that at most 0% of the players in a community can play Young Link or Link or Yoshi and still have some success. Okay? <laughs> so that's not good. You want a game in which, you know, players have freedom, in which players are able to do, kind of be able to participate in it as any character, right, and actually contribute um, and win. So this is sort of an immediate problem. Maybe you want to buff these characters, right? And, you know, this is not something you necessarily can easily find in the matchup charts because it depends on the interdependencies uh, on the, of the characters and who they beat and who beats them. Another thing we can look for are these sometimes dominant characters. So Fox, Falco, Marth, and Samus pop out here. These are characters for whom, if the players had their druthers, they could, they could play some enormous frequency. What this basically tells us is that if every player in the entire game wanted to play Fox, they could do so, and there would be nothing anyone else could really do to stop them. There's no other character that can come in and exploit the fact that everybody's playing Fox. It's like if you had this rock, paper, scissors community where everybody's playing rock, but there's just nothing that actually forces you to play something else. Now, as a designer, you basically have your choice. It's a matter of taste whether or not you want to do something about this. Maybe you think it's fine if everybody wants to play Fox. They won't. They will naturally self-distribute. That's reasonable. In our case, we had too many players playing Kratos. We didn't like it, and the players didn't like it. So I think it would have been really nice to actually know that this was kind of this possibility and find a version of the game in which that wasn't the case, which would require, essentially, uh, giving other characters counters to Kratos, right? Finding ways that they can force Kratos out of this dominant position. And then after producing those, you can actually test them with a few matchup charts and see whether you've solved the problem. So finally, they're always dominant characters. Um, now I'm looking at Super Smash Brothers Brawl data, which has an infamous problem. And you can see it here. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Meta Knight has to be played at least 55% of the time in any strong community. If you don't play him that much, Meta Knights will come in and destroy you. Okay, so it's this, there's this kind of inevitability that, like, no matter what, Meta Knight's going to completely dominate this game. Obviously, you don't want this situation, right? You may have one criticism, which is that, um, yeah, which is that if you look at the matchups for Meta Knight, they are totally obviously overpowered. Like, all his numbers are ridiculously high. He doesn't look anything like the other characters. You don't need all this fancy game theory to discover that, right? But this is an extreme case. What about these matchups? This is for PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. This is taken from median skill players, but equally informative. Um, now, if you look at this, again, I know you can't really see the numbers. The question is, is there a character here who totally dominates? Is there one character, like, you know, who just takes over the meta? I think it's, it's pretty hard to see, but when you actually do the computation, you see this. So it says that Sackboy has to be played basically half the time. Half of the players have to play Sackboy in sort of the convergent, one of any of the convergent states of this metagame. And this is like really, really important to know. And I just want to go back again just to show you this. There's nothing obvious here. Sackboy's the third highest character. He has a 5.7 average matchup. It's really about this kind of, you know, cyclical interplay between all these characters, right? It just so happens that the way his advantages and disadvantages work out, this is kind of a necessary consequence. And just as some confirmation of this reality, here are the frequencies of play for Sackboy in the first three weeks of the game. Uh, this is week one. He, they've already figured out they should play him, you know, 18% of the time. Week two, 25. Week three, he's more than 40% of the games are played by Sackboy, okay? And his win rates are not changing. This is players figuring it out. Right? They're realizing very, very quickly the meta is broken. And imagine if we had that matchup chart early on, and we also had these tools right, that would enable us to see where this was all inevitably heading, right? that Sackboy had this kind of inevitable place here. 
Now, this is high skill data, so it's a little different from the median skill data I showed you before, but um, you know, just as a consequence of how much data I have, but the same principle applies. Basically, um, I think we need to try this. <laughs> I, think, I think it's worth actually uh, applying these methods in the middle of a game, early on in a game's development. You know? And it's, it's not just about um, applying the tools or something, although you should know I put the code online. You can try it yourself, this GitHub URL. It's really, really simple. All you do is you take a little CSV of matchup charts, if you have them, how often each character wins, and it outputs some graphs like that. And you can look at intermediate results, too. And I really encourage people to do this, because I want to see how these methods work um, for different kinds of games. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways that we can think about uh, metagame balance. And you know, we're never going to have just this one true notion of what balance is. But the nice thing about these methods is that unlike these sort of vaguely defined tier lists, you know, they start from this really, really, really reliable source of data, these matchups, really well-defined data. And they produce something that you know, is, is kind of vaguely objective, right? It tells you not how players will play, but at least how they should play. And I think there's so much potential to take you know, this, kind of, this kind of data for the game, these matchup chart data, and learn all sorts of things about the game from it, right? Like really actually step back and take the analysis of our games seriously and not just put games out there and kind of see what sticks and see which players uh, you know, completely destroy our game, but try to get ahead of them and make a game that actually is good for these players who are now taking them so, so seriously. Uh, all right, well, thanks so much for listening. And that's all. I have like a few minutes for questions, so please. Oh, and also don't forget to put in your ratings on the, the rating email. Any questions? Come up to the microphone. Yeah, yeah hi, over there. Hi there. Um, I was wondering, do you think you could break down the metagame within the actual game into something like this and apply the same methods? Imagine like tic-tac-toe or something like that, where you're saying put X in the top left corner and then the next move and stuff like that. I'm so glad you asked, because this gets to a point that I uh, meant to mention. This is actually pretty key. The metagame is this incredibly simple game, OK? It's just this matrix of numbers, at least in the case of Street Fighter. <clears throat> it is more amenable to game theoretic analysis than almost any internals of any games that we play. It's a shame that we haven't looked at the metagame through game theory in the past, because it is the place where we can learn the most, most easily. And I encourage other people to do it. Unfortunately, you know, tic-tac-toe you can do, but most games are so complex that they're I, hard to analyze. I think, I think I'm going to give it a shot with our game. I'll, uh, oh, I'll tweet awesome. you the results. This is really, really cool. Yeah, you got to tell me how it worked um, out. The, the charts with the matchups and stuff like that, can that just be derived from uh, metrics in your game? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, you just look at win rates. Feel free to contact me. Yeah. No more time for questions? My clock says 2.47. Oh, yeah, that's right. I am done. I got confused with the time. Uh, let's go to the breakout room, whoever wants to talk, OK? Thanks a lot.